on the phone from the Uber blog, Hullabaloo, Digby. Welcome back to the program, Digby. All right, so uh, Digby, let's start first off. Uh, get a question from uh, our Twitter feed for you, which uh, may lead us into uh, some of the territory I want to talk about. When are going to be comments going to be re-enabled on your site? <laughs> yes, it's a it's a it's a social conservative plot, is what it is. Uh, it should be they should be enabled sometime very soon. I have someone re designing my site right now, and hopefully that will enable us to add comments back in. It's actually a technical problem with my very old blog, and until I get a new blog, um, there's nothing I can do. There's no, I can't even add blogger comments. So just everybody relax. It's not that I don't want comments. It's that I just can't have them at the moment, but they'll be back. All right. Well, we certainly understand the technical constraints uh, on this end. I can assure you of that. Um, all right. Let's start. I want to start with this. Uh, there was a piece in um, in in uh, in Politico uh, this past week uh, by Jonathan Martin, and and it, it's written in the context of all of the supposed shifts, the rebranding that we're seeing in the Republican Party. The, um, the fracturing that seems to be taking place with the social conservative movement over uh, things like marriage equality, like uh, immigration, uh, not so much uh, on, uh, on women's choice issues, uh, perhaps on guns to a certain extent. Um, and, and, and while we may not see as much <clears throat> legislative uh, changes uh, as a result of this supposed fracturing that's taking place on the right, um, there's certainly, uh, there certainly, I think, some, some political implications. And there, uh, there, was, a, there was a fascinating quote uh, by Gary Bauer, who we all recall as being a, um, a wonderful uh, uh, right-wing uh, congressman. And was he ever a senator? I don't think he was a senator. But he's now, I can't remember what he's the, the head of now, but it is some, uh, you know, uh, far-right uh, Christian conservative knockoff uh, organization. And he, this quote I, I, I found pretty stunning, and its implications are not just for the Republican Party, but I think for the Democratic Party. Uh, if we gave our voters an accurate portrayal of our ideas, he said, that we want to cut the rate of growth on Social Security, give tax cuts to billionaires, and then the, the values issues, the values issues would be more popular than the economic agenda of the current Republican Party. Basically saying what many of us have been saying for a long time that the Republican Party has used uh, social issues as a way of screwing <laughs> a lot of their uh, own people, which is not to say that the Democrats, um, in some respects, aren't going to be screwing uh, their own people in similar fashion. Uh, but uh, at the very least, that's the formula for the Republicans. Uh, g give me your sense of of how of where this goes next, I mean, both for the Republicans and what the implications are if the rebranding or the actual issue stance changes for the Republicans. Well, I think they have a problem, and I think that Gary Bauer um, basically, you know, illuminated that because, you know, remember, they've always – uh, defined themselves by this three-legged stool. Remember, it's it's uh, family values on the one hand, you know, social conservatism, uh, fiscal conservatism is the other one, and then the other one is you know militaristic national security. Now, if they take away the social conservative brand, uh, take away that leg of the stool, they have a problem. They do fall over, and that particular part of it is one that those people prioritize those issues. That's not just something. And, in fact, as Bauer points out, they don't really like the, the economic conservatism. I mean, it's, you know, in theory they do. You know, yes, they think that the government's giving away, you know, unearned benefits to people who don't deserve it. You know, unlike themselves, they worked for it and other people don't and all of that. But nonetheless, that's not their – that's not the reason that they involve themselves in politics. It's not the reason that they care about, um, you know, political issues or, or civic issues, that, you know, however you want to put it. They are, they are energized and motivated by something else. And the party – this is a big group, by the way. This is a huge faction – far larger than, say, African-Americans are to the Democratic Party. 
This is something like 30 percent of the Democratic Party. It's a big group. They're playing with fire by doing this. Now, I know that it's very popular to say, well, you know, they've lost and they've got to reevaluate and they've got to go back and, and you know, do some soul searching and figuring out what to do. Well, you know, maybe they do, but I think casting aside these, you know, cultural issues for them is probably more dangerous than moderating their economic stance. But you'll notice there has not been even the slightest discussion that it might be a good idea to rethink some of their uh, their economic ideas. In fact, if anything, they're doubling down. I heard this morning that Rob Portman, who recently came out, you know, in favor of gay marriage because his son is gay and he had a, a personal epiphany, um, he's being given a pass by, by many um, of the, you know, fiscal conservatives and saying, well, you know, that's okay, because what he's really hardcore on, uh, on these uh, economic issues. So we can count on him to be there when it counts. And when it counts for the party elites, as Gary Bauer points out, you know, he says in the, in the article in another spot, he says, if he thinks we can win by getting across the idea that we're no different on values, they're clueless about the fact that they're going to lose voters. Um, they don't seem to understand that, you know, I mean, they're all for, for keeping these uh, economic issues as hardcore to the right as they can keep them. Um, but, you know, maybe Rob Portman can get away with it, but I don't know whether or not the party as a whole is going to do okay. I think, you know, Mike Huckabee said we'll form a third party, and I wouldn't put it past them to do it if, the, if these, you know, social conservatives feel truly alienated from the party. I mean, it, what, what's going to be interesting is because the, the, the Republican Party is now, it seems to me, is uh, you could divide them between sort of House members and then anyone else who has to run in a bigger in a in a bigger arena than uh, a a house district, right? Because uh, a house district, you're going to be able to uh, the, through gerrymandering. I think I I saw uh, before uh, I I went on my extended leave that while the percentage of the electorate of white people had r- shrunk by two percent, the percentage of white people in Republican congressional districts had actually increased by 2%. And -hmm. that was a function of redistricting. And that means that while the constituency for Republican ideas on a national level has shrunk, the constituency within these districts for Republican social values has increased. And so uh, you're going to, it seems to me that we have a two track Republican party. And the question is, can they maintain that? Can they, can you have uh, Rob Portman as really just the exception to the rule, and maybe one or two backbenchers in the House who uh, who can come out for uh, things like marriage equality, and then the rest are really just sort of the the Peggy Noonans, the the people who just go on TV who have no who have no constituency other than uh, these the, the sort of the national Republican overlords. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, it. it it appears to me that this could actually stay fairly stable for a while. I mean, it's hard to see. You know, we talk a lot about this emerging Democratic majority and the demographic change and, and everything. But it, it's it's easy for me to sort of see that you could have a kind of a, a reversal of the post- um, you know, FDR era in which there was a very stable Democratic, you know, congressional um, majority that very rarely shifted over the course of all those years, while the presidency would remain somewhat in flux, but more commonly in Democratic hands, um, as, as it, you know, as it was as commonly in, in Republican hands, even though they, they were, and, and you remember what that was, that was called the liberal consensus, and I hate to say it, but this would be called the conservative consensus, regardless of whether or not the president was a Democrat. If, if judging by the current, the way that the, the you know things are sort of playing out currently, because even with a small you know uh, it's basically a rump faction in the United in the United States political scene, their power is such in just by holding one House of Congress and and potentially they can hold the Senate too. I mean there's a, there's a good chance they're going to win the Senate in 2014. Um, that, you know, from that perch of even being a rump faction in these gerrymandered districts, they could conceivably continue to hold 
sway over uh, and let's not forget we have a conservative supreme court majority as well um you know they could hold sway over over our political scene regardless of the fact that we have this emerging democratic majority can you know consisting of the youth and 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 uh latinos and you know the rest that we've all discussed ad nauseum so you know this is you know as much as i i enjoy uh taking the big victory lap about you know the, how the democrats have prevailed and you know liberalism is on the rise and what have you and and while it may be in theory our structural problem here um looks to me as if it could be in place for a while now that can change you know uh, this this uh Rick Perlstein wrote a piece um this week in the nation uh talking about how events and and you know and presidents if they if they play their cards right can actually flip this very very quickly and he points out that the civil rights movement had that effect when and it wasn't just because of the southern strategy although that was part of it but that constituency of african americans in you know had long been the stronghold of the republican urban um or a stronghold of republican urban and suburban um you know, northeastern, um, you know, political machines. And when that flipped, that, you know, that flipped for them as well. And that sort of precipitated a, a very big change. And this can happen very quickly. And so it is possible that that can, but I don't know that it's predictable. And I don't think it has the sort of, you know, this inexorable march to, you know, liberal dominance that we seem to be talking about all the time in the, you know, at least in the in the liberal press doesn't seem to me you know i guess the point is is that is that you know barring some kind of event or some switch in in party elite strategy i'm thinking we're looking more at stasis than we are looking at major major change and, and that i you know i don't know if that's the case or not but that's just how it feels to me i want to talk about that scenario that if if what gary bauer is talking about actually happens what the implications are for the democratic party but before we get there let's talk about that conservative consensus because when we're talking about that conservative consensus we're talking about it on a on in terms of economics yes. and and one of the things that happened over the past week or so i mean everything is sort of blended in together to me because i you know night is day and day is night for me at this point um in terms of the amount of sleep i'm getting but <laughs> the uh there was a, a resolution that was passed as part of the budget um uh, bill in the senate that changed the way or called for the CBO to change to accept dynamic scoring. And this is really important because when we hear about all of the talk, uh, the, the president and the administration still sort of pathologically keeping entitlement reform on the table, and by entitlement reform we all know that we're talking about is cuts to benefits uh, for Social Security recipients and, and probably Medicare recipients in some fashion or another. Um, that this dynamic scoring is very important. Just talk about that for a, a brief moment because, um, you know, one of the things I did see also when uh, before I left was, and we got to take this with a grain of salt, is this uh, polling that Republicans did in specific uh, potential swing districts where they see potential pickups uh, of uh, Democratic seats and showing that people were, were that voters in those districts we're very keyed into the deficit and the debt as a big problem. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and this dynamic scoring plays into this because it basically, well, it, it, it talk about this, but it, 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 it plays into the notion that uh, of, of Reaganomics in some res, uh, respect, that uh, cutting taxes actually raises revenue. Right. Well, dynamic scoring has been, you know, one of the holy grails for the for the Republicans and the right. Well, I shouldn't just say them. The, there are certain centrists that have been in favor of this for a long time as well. And what it basically is, it's a little bit of mumbo jumbo, at least in my opinion, in which it's asking the CBO, which right now is is just very, you know, simply focused on pre on predicting how you know the budget how the budget will look in the future, projecting it based upon certain assumptions about yeah, money spent and money coming in. What they're asking them to do is to make a bunch of assumptions about how people are going to behave as a result of these, you know, these changes, the money coming in and going out. You know, this is a field in economics that is very interesting, 
you know, so you remember Freakonomics, and, you know, there were a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of study going on in this way. It's very, very fascinating and extremely dangerous to start having the government play this game. They do not, it is not a field which is, you know, well established enough or that even, that they even know how to make the models to make this work. And what it's designed to do basically is, is have the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, and various other government budget prognosticators um, make the case for cutting taxes because, you know, again, we're back to that old supply side, you know, stale supply side idea that the more you cut taxes, the more money you will bring in. And, you know, I think that's been proven to be nonsense, but they're not going to give up. Now, what they did was they passed this. It came in through, it came out of the committee on a party line vote in the House, and then they, you know, they ended up passing it. The idea that, and it was not, it's not a, it was like a, you know, a state of the, state of the Congress or something, you know, statement of the Congress. It wasn't something, you know, it wasn't a specific law, but it was just to say, yes, we agree with this. We think we should be doing it. And this is one of those things that the right does. They, you know, they're very good at it. They get this stuff. They just slowly but surely, you know, whittle away at this. And over time, what that does is that ends up changing the assumption of what is normal. I mean, and we all see this when we watch the media. You know, you see, for instance, right now, the consensus among the political establishment is that entitlements are going broke. We've got to, you know, in order to save them, you know, essentially we have to destroy them. Um, the only thing we can do is cut them. And that is the result of many, many years of propaganda by people like Pete Peterson and various other you know, fiscal conservatives, deficit hawks, saying this stuff over and over again. So this is how they do it. And, then, you know, this is – it's an important aspect of politics that I don't think the Democrats do much at all, which is sort of play this, this long-term game of, of changing assumptions. You know, essentially they're, they're very, very reactive and have been for a long, long time. And they don't – you know, they're, well, we can barely count on them to even protect their own signature achievements at this point. So I guess looking forward is too much to ask. But that is – you know, that's one of the functions of a political party is to set up the assumptions, to set up the, the, the cultural framework um, under which we all operate. And, you know, the conservatives have been very, very good at doing that. And they're continuing to, even from their alleged – position of weakness. And, you know, as, as you can see the, the results of this, I mean, now we have a Democratic president chasing a, you know, a, what I think of as his white whale of a grand bargain, relentlessly pursuing the idea that it is a good thing for a Democrat to cut Social Security, <laughs> Medicare, and Medicaid, that this will be a legacy achievement of his, that people will remember him fondly, uh, you know, in the same way they remember Ronald Reagan, if he manages to get this thing done. Now, I mean, think about that. I mean, this is this is the I, Democrat doing that. And I, I think the, 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 the analogy is really more, uh, in my mind, it is Bill Clinton cutting welfare. Well, uh, that because too. that has been a, uh, a disaster that we have sort of like a slow... Uh, revealing disaster as you as uh, when you when, when you particularly when you hit a period of, of joblessness that we like we've been in uh, yet you know I, I said I've said this ad nauseum on this program every time it's mentioned on uh, in any type of uh, national forum you know good television essentially uh, people just say you know Clinton did welfare reform in yep. in, in a positive and it's it, it is that is a uh, part of the bucket list, I think, in the in the 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 White House. Now, now, I just want to I want to just make a, a, a I don't want to belabor this um, this uh, CBO thing, but people should understand essentially what it what this dynamic scoring does is, and and they haven't adopted it, but by getting a majority of senators, including seven Democrats, to sign off on this, it is basically saying that when we present a budget that says we're going to cut taxes. And with the um, we uh, on on one part of the ledger, and show that uh, revenues increase because of it on the other side of the ledger, you got to sign off on it and say that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> because and uh, again, like you say, it's not binding, but as it gains traction as an idea, 
uh, it becomes uh, uh, problematic in the same way that the phrase, when a uh, family t- uh, has to tighten its belt, the government should too. I mean, that's, you know, it, it, that's not real. Um, economists disagree with that notion. Even Joe Scarborough says that we should be adding more stimulus. Um, uh, you know, but uh, it becomes adopted, and then it uh, impacts our politics because the president, uh, you know, uh, by all uh, accounts, said, "Well, I'm not going to fight that fight." Essentially, I'm not going to dis- disabuse the American public of that notion. I will come out for it to get, uh, you know, as they say, within the circle of their uh, of their belief system to uh, attempt to sell them something else. But of course, you can't sell them the opposite, which is really what we needed to be sold at that point. <laughs> well, it's not even on the table. The opposite is just completely ignored, as we're seeing even now without dynamic scoring. You know, the pursuit of austerity at a time of, of, you know, economic malaise at best, um, you know, is totally <laughs> wrong, but we're doing it anyway, because the idea of, you know, the government has to cut back has become, uh, you know, that there's a certain kind of instinctive logic to that that no one has actually challenged. Uh, certainly the president hasn't. He's been going along saying, well, we need to do deficit reduction, too. The difference is... We, we want to do it in a more balanced way, whereas they just want to do it by cutting spending. Nobody's challenged the idea at all that we've done enough deficit reduction and that the deficit projections, as they, even as they are currently uh, scored, will, you know, will, will shrink if the economy comes back. And, in fact, we should do the opposite. I mean, I think that that argument just isn't in, out there. And I think you know, it's a difficult one to make. I agree that it's not easy to, te- to explain to people that in that the government in you know the the whole you know the Keynesian framework for for dealing with uh, this kind of you know lack of demand that's in the in the economy, but nonetheless, I mean somebody ought to do it because it, what's happening is the opposite, and we're ending up choking off the economy. And in fact, they're walking in to these political you know <sighs> ridiculous political traps they set for themselves, whether on purpose or by accident, like the sequester, which means you know we're cutting the heck out of everything at exactly the wrong moment. Um, and, and, and the deal that's being put on the table is, well, the only thing we can do to stop that is to cut things in the future, uh, like uh, Medicare and Social Security. <laughs> so we can only, you know, now we're at a moment where the argument centers around the idea of you can either cut now or you can cut later, but you have to cut. And we're putting forward the idea that we're going to cut later, so that's really the better of the two options. That's the Democratic position, when in fact – there should be no cutting. I mean, just, cutting is it should be should be uh, out of there, especially since they've done a tremendous amount of cutting already. Right. I mean, they have three trillion dollars in deficit reduction, through, mostly through spending cuts, but through some uh, you know revenue that they got in the fiscal cliff deal. You know, let's let's declare victory on deficit <laughs> and, and move along because this is really very detrimental. But nonetheless, you know, we got ourselves into this position. I, and um, it's kind of hard at this point to um, sort of excuse any of it as saying that it was accidental, since on both sides of the aisle, the, um, you know, the mantra from the beginning, once the stimulus was done, which was at the very first month of the Obama administration's first term, We've been talking about deficits, and it, you know, it's and very hard. <laughs> I find it's very hard to find to, to really. I have no sense of where we go from here because we're now just starting to see the stories come out about the implications of the sequester, but they're all essentially aggregated stories of local stories. You know, I mean, this is. I mean, the the one thing that has become clear to me about the sequester. There's two things I think that have become clear to me. Um, one is, is that if we take Gene Sperling at his word, the, the head of, um, or w- one of the uh, chief uh, economic advisors to uh, President Obama, that the sequester was designed to force a grand bargain, right? I mean, yeah. he told this to Bob Woodward. He said it on his, uh, his Reddit AMA that um, this, the idea behind the sequester was is that the Republicans wouldn't be able to stomach it. They would be forced to come to the table. We'll be willing to offer entitlement cuts to make it easier for them to swallow uh, increased revenues in the form of 
of higher taxes on the wealthy and uh, some uh, get rid of some tax expenditures like um, maybe the home mortgage deduction for the wealthy, maybe uh, carried interest loopholes, et cetera, et cetera. There's two things that, that, that come out of that in, in far as I'm concerned. is One, they really wanted to get to entitlement reform, which we've already talked about. And two, they're not very good at this. <laughs> I mean, I, because the, the, uh, they, they failed to uh, – it is one thing to say, okay, I have a disagreement with the administration as to where we should be getting to, okay, that you should design a, a mechanism – to uh, get to entitlement reform and raising revenues. Uh, I, I can disagree with their agenda there, but they also failed to even execute that. And so now we're stuck with the sequester. They, they blew the politics on the sequester because they didn't understand that. And, and, you know, two months ago, I think we were talking, uh, I think we had this conversation of the sequester is going to hit, the polling shows that the Republicans are going to get blamed for it. The problem is, is that, Will the American public be conscious of it in a way that they're blaming the Republicans can happen? And it seems like now, uh, short of a piece in the Huffington Post by Sam Stein and uh, Amanda Turkle, and then a piece, I think, on BuzzFeed today about the implications of the sequester on one, uh, on one military personnel, um, there's, there's very little reporting and very little way for the national media to cover this story because well, it's so I, localized. I agree. And I don't, yeah, I don't think, you know, look, there's going to be anecdotal stories of, you know, I mean, you hear the odd, you know, Michelle Bachman, you know, whining because in her district something's happening and then saying, but we need to cut, but just not here. There's this sort of, you know. Uh, sequester nimbyism, I think Brian Buehler called it, which I think is kind of a good term. Um, and, you know, maybe this is going to grow and, you know, we'll get this. What I suspect, however, is happening is that what you're finding is a lot of pressure behind the scenes from major corporations and certainly from defense contractors to, you know, deal with these things quietly under the radar. We're already seeing there are reports that, you know, they have already um, mitigated some of the defense cuts, which both Democrats and Republicans want, of course, although that was supposed to be the big, you know, the big roadblock that would bring the Republicans to the table mm -hmm. the minute that the defense cuts happened. Well, that's a bipartisan thing. That's not just Republicans. Democrat, there's a huge faction of the Democratic Party that is very supportive of these defense contractors, plus the administration. I mean, let's, you know, that they have said quite clearly, we will not, you know, in fact, Obama said that he couldn't back Simpson Bowles, not because of the Social Security cuts, obviously, but because of the defense cuts that they proposed. So that was always kind of a phony construct there, that this was going to be the Republican um, motivator. Um, so what they're doing is behind the scenes, they're whittling away at this. I mean, this has already happened with the, with the continuing resolution. They had, you know, they did some tweaks there to offset some of those defense cuts. So, you know, I can see that happening where under the radar, the big, you know, the, the, the big interest, the big special interest, um, working away at it while the government expenses that are directly attributable to government, say, you know, shutting down an airport terminal or, you know, doing the kind of things that really inconvenience people, that may become more obvious, but, you know, they're going to blame the government, right? I mean, did they blame Republicans for this? Right. Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, maybe, but I think what they do blame is that the government's dysfunctional, oh, how we hate the government, and who, what, what group is it that um, makes a profit at that particular you I mean, know, the, that particular attitude. The only way yeah. it seems to me for the Republicans to pay any type of uh, political price in these situations uh, is is if they are challenged in specific House races for voting for the sequester, essentially. Yes. And it, it ruining like, OK, and now. The, the, the sad thing is that we see, you know, stories of uh, uh, some of the more prominent stories I'm seeing are a lot of cuts to things like Head Start, uh, a lot yep. of cuts to um, to food programs for the poor, you know, essentially programs that have very little constituencies anyways, uh, or at least I should say very um, uh, weak or not politically powerful constituencies. And uh, so when you get like, OK, they shut down our regional airport, then maybe you can see an opening for a challenger 
uh, in the 2014 election to come in and say, you voted for this. You, you're yep. the one who's hurt, uh, you know, I don't know, Kalamazoo's uh, economic development because they've cut, you know, they've shut down our, our regional airport or whatever it is. Uh, and, and that is not the stuff that you can make, you can nationalize a campaign on. No, no, but that is something that you can do in a in a local campaign. And I, you know, by the way, Sam, it, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't just Republicans who voted for this. Right, cluster. right. I mean, there are a lot of Democrats who are going to be on the line for this thing too. And I would guess that you know, when it comes to stuff like Head Start or you know, caring about actual human beings instead of big, you know, corporate interests, that they're going to get hit with a bunch of lugubrious, sanctimonious Republicans saying, look what you've done to the people. You know, these Democrats are going right. to get hit weirdly from the, from the left by, by the right. Um, and, and they're going to pay a price for that because, you know, they, I don't think that Republicans are going to have any compunction whatsoever about running against Democrats on an issue that they themselves would have undoubtedly voted for if they'd had the chance. Although there were some some Republicans who voted against the sequester, too. Um, they were the hardcore, super, you know, far-right types like Michelle Bachman, who basically wanted to, uh, you know, have <laughs> default on the debt, you know. Right. Um, but de- a lot of Democrats voted against the sequester, too. It shouldn't be said that was not a majority of Democrats. M- many Democrats voted against it and, and on for the right reasons. You know, they kind of saw the handwriting on the wall here and recognized that it was not a good idea to be playing, you know, games with these programs that are very, very important to real human beings in a time of economic distress. I mean, it's not like these are good times and everybody can just, well, you know, we'll make up for it. We'll move some money around or something. I mean, this is, this is, all these states are very cash strapped and this is not an easy thing for them to deal with. Having said that, though, what I see coming along the pike is that, you know, the, the, the pressure is going to be on those liberal Democrats. They're going to be the ones who are going to be asked at some point down the road here to make the grand bargain if John yes. Boehner can find enough Republicans to and, and get them to agree to let him bring it to the floor. This, I mean, that is the thing, is mind. that, you know, people talk about the 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 how wonderful, what a wonderful victory that the Hastert rule uh, being that uh, no no bill will be brought to the floor if it doesn't have uh, a Republican majority uh, supporting it. The wonderful uh, aspect of the Hastert rule being broken and trash forever, as if uh-huh. as if anybody cared <laughs> uh, about that I, at all. And is it is that going to hold? I mean, my understanding was that when they agreed to do it on the fiscal cliff deal, that they extracted a you know a. a pledge that he would not do it. Well, there were two other instances, uh, and uh, they escaped me at the moment, uh, where we have seen the the Hastert rule not in effect over the past uh, three months. Yeah. And I I can't I can't remember. But but the point being is that when this grand bargain and, you know, this story, I think it was in the um, uh, it was in the uh, uh, what is the Wall Street Journal? Um, the White House is strongly considering including limits on entitlement benefits in its fiscal 2014 yes. budget. Uh, so they're thinking about they're thinking about even sort of like you're not going to accept the grand bargain. We're going to force feed you these cuts. <laughs> We're going to force feed you these cuts to uh, to entitlements, and you're going to love it. I mean, this is. <laughs> This is the Republican wet dream, right? I mean, we're going to get cuts to Social Security and Medicare to take back to our thing, and, and we're going to be able to say, the Democrats did it. And, yes. and And so this is the wet dream. But the bottom line is, is that they will also include what would be a poison pill for Republicans, that being any type of, um, of revenue increase via loopholes or whatever, new taxes, whatever we want to call it. And it is going to be incumbent upon... Uh, a large number of Democrats to join with a smaller number of Republicans in the House to pass this bill. So yeah. it's basically going to be um, not only are we going to cut entitlements, not only are we going to hurt um, uh, the people who are getting these benefits, not only are we going to hurt the the brand of the Democratic Party, but in 2014, you're going to have to run against Republicans who said you voted to cut Social Security. And the question is, do the do the Democrats in the House, have the sense, both politically and, frankly, morally, and in terms of uh, just sheer economics, have the sense to say, we're not going to go along with this grand bargain. Are they going to break from the president here? 
You know, I don't know. It, it's it's obviously not. <laughs> you know, if precedent is meaningful in any way, um, you know, you don't want to be too sure of this. Nancy right. Pelosi has clearly come out in favor of the chain CPI, which is very bad news. On the other hand, there's been two letters that have been circulated to the president, one of which done by, by Alan Grayson, uh, by Congressman Grayson and Takano, which has said, we just won't vote for anything that includes cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, period. And you couldn't even, and get, that, the full, you couldn't even get the full Progressive Caucus to sign on to that. I think there's only about it. 30, 35 they members. They have a lot, and there are more signing on right. as time goes on. But it wasn't like a big rush. No. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. There's another letter, which is a lot, has a lot more, uh, you know. Is, wiggle is, room. Yeah, wiggle room, where they're saying, you know, we are against this. We are opposed to it, which, you know, whatever. I mean, that, that could mean anything. I mean, but uh, my personal feeling is that we have a different situation here than, you know, a lot of people hearken back to the, to the health care debate in which the progressives, you know, pledged that they wouldn't do, you know, they wouldn't sign on to any deal that didn't include the public option, and they reneged on that. But this is different because, the, you know, the public option was an advance, right? I mean, that was something we wanted to get. It wasn't actually taking away something that we already had. And, indeed, the argument made to progressive Democrats, and, and it was a compelling argument at the time, was that this expansion of the Medicaid program was as, as significant as anything that had happened since the 60s. And it was. And that was a, that's a straight-up government program. You know, people, there's no private insurers involved in that, or there wasn't. There wasn't until, at the time. Maybe recently. Right. Um, but at the time, the idea was, look, this is a huge public program, and it's for some of the neediest people that we have, the working poor. You, can't, you know, are you really going to walk away from that because you didn't get something that you wanted, some advance? That's one argument. This is different. We have two hostages here. We have the elderly with Medicare and Social Security, and we have Medicaid, which is that very program that they were sort of, you know, pressured into accepting in the health care debate. Those are on the chopping block, at, or you've got today the Head Start kids, the, you know, the people on, you know, um, you know, S-CHIP and these various other programs that are being squeezed by the sequester. So essentially what's happened is, is that the Democratic establishment, including the White House, is telling liberal Democrats, we're shooting a hostage, and this is Sophie's choice here, you pick. Are we going right. to shoot the Head Start kids today, or are we going to shoot the elderly tomorrow? But somebody's going to get shot. Now, to my way of thinking, and maybe this is just me being, a, you know, a dirty, hippie, scruffy blogger, but to me, that's one you walk away from. There is no upside there. And I do not see why Democrats, I can't find the logic that allows me to say <laughs> that you should, uh, you know, accede to one of those. I would, I would add, though. I would add that the other aspect that is different is you're no longer running on President Obama's coattails. Exactly, exactly. And by the way, Sam, these Democrats where possible, will be attacked from the left. They will get primary challengers if they right. sign away Social Security. I guarantee that wherever there is one, and there may be more than otherwise would have happened if they do this, because some people may be compelled to run, they're going to get attacked from the left in primaries. And whether they win or not, incumbents usually do win, that <laughs> they will be softened up by the, you know, the left on this Social Security matter, at which point their right-wing challenger, not an incumbent, no voting record to defend, will come in and attack them from the right on Social Security cuts. Democrats are going to get it really hard on this. This is going to be a very difficult vote. They should know that. They should know what kind of attack they're going to face. This is huge. They didn't call it the third rail for nothing. You know, right. this this. This is the most dangerous ground you can trod for a Democrat to do it. I can't even imagine why they're contemplating it. Honestly, it should just be, you know, no, no, we're not doing that. You know, it should just be, no. <laughs> I, don't know I don't know what you've been smoking, but please just, you know, put it away, because this is not going to happen. Um, but, you know, here we are. And, uh, you know, I hope they're ready for it if they do it. And I still believe that that's the only way this can pass. I don't think, you know, Republicans are not going to, going to carry the, you know, carry the load on this. They're going to make the Democrats do it. That's the whole point here. Right. And they've got the, you know, the White House on board. All they need to do is get a majority of Democrats in the House and a large faction of the Senate, who, and I don't think there's any doubt they can get a majority there. Maybe there'd be a filibuster. I don't know. But, you know, 
another story. But you know, this could this could end up uh, you know falling on the Democrat shoulder that they. You know, and for some reason, the White House thinks that this is a great legacy building thing that everybody, despite the fact that it's like I, I, I actually don't think that they're wrong about this. I mean, for, for the White House, I don't think that they're wrong because, you know, whether it's a, a week after uh, the Obama presidency is over or uh, five or 10 years, it's still going to be uh, the media is still going to be dominated by people who don't give a crap at the end of the day about, uh, you know, some people getting, you know, whatever, 5 10% less on their Social Security benefits. They don't care that some people are going to have to work longer. It's just not an issue for them. And so I think that's the, that's the and I don't know how cynical they get in the uh, White House uh, to perceive that. It could just be that is what they understand, you know, but I think, uh, and, and, and rather, they, they don't break it down in the same way that, uh, you know, you or I might, that um, the establishment is never going to punish a Democrat for making government less responsive to the people, uh, that uh, they're actually going to re reward the, that Democrat. I mean, you know, that, that's, the whole, the, that's the whole story here, right? Is it if you are uh, anyone from David Gregory through just about anybody else in the media, uh, short of a couple of hosts on MSNBC, um, and not even uh, the majority of their contributors, I would say, um, if you if you somehow manage to keep people from getting something from government, and you're a Democrat, then you that that puts you in the the, the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. They will, they certainly, the villagers will reward the Democrats for doing this. There's no doubt about it. They, they, this is what they love more than anything. On the other hand, I have to say that I think that legacies, legacies are built by specific people. Uh, your enemies, of course, will do everything they can to create the legacy that they want. And I think we can expect that they will not be, the right is not going to be kind to Barack Obama, whether or not, I mean, you know, he ordered the killing of Osama bin Laden, and they still hate his gut. So, I, right. I, you know, it's hard to see how he could do anything, and including this, that they would approve of. So I think we can feel sure that they're going to write his legacy as one of abject failure, horror, and, you know, complete, you know, communistic usurpment. Yes, this will be the, but, the dark period of, uh, yeah, no pun intended, dark period of, of, uh, in more ways of than one. American <laughs> politics for them. Right. But the, uh, on the, you know, and, and yes, there are the, you know, the media will, will have its, you know, first draft of history, which we've seen many, you know, well, I'm old enough, you probably aren't, but I'm old enough to have seen their first drafts uh, that, that they don't always hold up. Because the other side that has to write it is the, you know, the supporters. And, you know, Barack Obama has a lot of affection um, and still among Democrats. I think that they generally like him. I suspect, however, that over time the, the liberal faction will fall away if he, do, if he manages to get this Social Security uh, or, quote, entitlements um, cuts through. And without that, he's going to have a problem writing a liberal legacy. I yes. think that, that, you know, he does need to have those people on his side. And to be fair to him, he does have a liberal legacy. It already exists. He's got one. It's called Obamacare. And he has been very pro, I shouldn't say very, but he has been the president in power who shifted the White House stance on gay rights through Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and then his personal shift on gay marriage. And um, both of those things are significant. They're substantial achievements. And, you know, that's, going, that's on his record. Um, you know, Obamacare, we don't know what's going to happen, but we do know that he managed to get a health care reform passed, and that is, that's significant. He doesn't need this. Uh, you know, the reason he's doing this entitlement thing is for those villagers, those right. people who, you know, Absolutely. he's afraid of that liberal legacy and needs to mitigate it somehow, I think, by doing something that, you know, these centrists and, and these, you know, basically establishment elites, whatever they are politically, um, that they will they will give him credit for doing something that was really hard that was going to as he puts I, it. I'll you know, tell you, I think the thing that we need because you know I, I still uh, contend that um, if I if I if I was them and I was worried about my legacy in that manner and um, that was uh, the the most important thing to me, I would just look and say like these are the guys who are going to get the book deals. Uh, these are the villagers are the ones who are going to get the book deals. They have the platforms to sell them. I mean, uh, somebody's got to get a book out right now. Do our 
you know, get a do a Woodward version of uh, you know how things fell apart, just sort of anticipating uh, this cut, but uh, these cuts to entitlements. But uh, you know, hope springs eternal. Get hey, on that that's book. That's a good Digby. idea, Sam. You should write. I was it. just gonna say, Digby. I don't have the time right now. I got a baby at home. You gotta get. You gotta get on that book. Uh, let's I know. do this. I've been wondering if there was something out there. Yeah, I'll write. I'll write the uh, dystopian <laughs> future of Ob- Barack Obama's legacy. That ought to sell, huh? All right. I'll well, right wingers, uh, but you know. Well, yes. I mean, well, well, just you know, you just got to know where to market it. That's all. You got to uh, just <laughs> well, there uh, is that. shadow Dick Morris and see where he's trying to sell his stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's definitely there should be a, a a slot open for that somewhere. All right. Well, uh, Digby, always a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time today. Uh, we'll talk to you soon.